where is brewing, where does brewing take place? Um, we're going to be starting in England in the, in the Middle Ages, and there's basically one place where brewing happens. It's everybody's home. Brewing is a, is a housewife's chore for the most part, um, and in another uh, uh, domestic setting, monks would brew beer in their, for their monasteries, both for their own consumption and to, um, and to sell. Uh, this, this diagram illustrates a professional brewer in a guild. The six-pointed star is the brewer's symbol. Um, some people have thought it might have something to do with the Star of David. It does not. It is actually an alchemical symbol for boiling, which is what brewing actually means. So the brewing process is really a boiling process, and we'll talk about those ingredients. So once the men got involved, um, the women essentially were somewhat put out of business. Um, in their domestic brewing, so brewing was more commercial. And here's an early 17th century woodcut of a brewery, an outdoor brewery. In the back you can see some boiling happening, some fire, where the wort is boiled. Um, that wort, hot wort, is then transferred up to a cooling vessel, um, where, it, uh, where it's very, um, very open and, and shallow, so that the cooling could take place very, um, very rapidly, relatively rapidly. Then it's brought down into fermentation vessels, where yeast is added in and it starts bubbling away over the course of a week or so and then finally it's put into barrels um, to, be, to be consumed. Here's an illustration of a modern brewery. Um, the copper vessels are usually where heating takes place and the stainless steel vessels are the fermentation tanks. Looks a lot different and there is a lot of difference but in, in some sense the, the process has remained the same. So we'll talk a little bit about what's the same, what's different. Hops is what kept beer um, from, going, from going bad very quickly. But Hops were not always used. Hops were adopted in about the 12th or 13th century in England, a little earlier on the continent. Um, before that, in the Middle Ages, um, other herbs were used, and you can still find beers, um, some really quite good beers that are brewed with a variety of herbs. The brewer's term for this collection of non-hop herbs is called gruit, G-R-U-I-T, and that, re that refers to a mixture of herbs. Um, some very common herbs like heather, rosemary, lavender, um, pine, uh, the, the tips of pine or spruce um, trees of the needles um, can be used. These herbs were often used and the term herbal is a book that um, this, this is a page from an herbal uh, which not only lists what these plants are like but what medicinal properties they would have. Um, so the beers, people making beers would add in different herbs to treat or they would claim to treat different diseases. <coughs> so, in the, so this was um, early in the, in the Middle Ages in England and then um, on the continent um, hops were used at around the 10th century and then eventually came over to England and essentially supplanted the, um, for the most part, other herbs. Uh, and I should have mentioned, um, the ale refers to the, the, the malted beverages that were brewed with the uh, other herbs and beer was the term that was first used to just refer to hopped ale. Those, those terms have changed. As its name implies, the old ale is aged. Um, and to age beer, um, or it's, it's sort of a chicken and egg situation, if you have stronger beer, higher alcohol, it tastes better if you let it sit for several months or even over years. I mean, think about fine wines, for instance. Um, so if you brew a stronger beer, it's not going to taste as good, uh, fresh, right out of the, right out of the, um, out of the cask. Um, so there are old ales and they'll have names like Old Engine Oil and Old Peculiar and things like that. And this one, if you notice, Old Engine Oil is labeled as a porter. Well, it just happens to be a stronger porter, so it, 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 does, it benefits by, by being aged a little bit. Um, and barley wine, similarly, is a, is a higher alcohol um, uh, beer. Um, it's usually not as dark as the, as the old ales, um, and those can be aged for many, many years. This is a very famous example, Thomas Hardy's Ale, which if you can see up here is numbered. Generally speaking, I mean, they'll have a lot of hops in them because of the strength of the alcohol, and one needs to balance all the malt and the alcohol and the hops, so you have to have a balance. But you won't really taste too much of it. It won't taste like that hoppy kind of beer if that's something that, you've, that you're into. It'll be much more in the malty area. All right, I wanted to also highlight some of the books here at CHF. Chemical Heritage Foundation is a museum, as you can see here, and also a research library. And I've had the uh, a good fortune of being able to work in that library uh, from different times for my research. And I just wanted to highlight a few books. I put the uh, pictures on the front of that uh, um, handout just to kind of give you a reminder. Um, 
This, uh, this text by a, a gentleman named William Wyworth, sort of an odd name, um, he actually was, came over to London from the Netherlands, from Holland, um, right around this time at the end of the um, 17th century. He was a correspondent with Isaac Newton. If any of you know about a little bit about the history of science, you'll know that the 17th century was you know, the, the, the peak of the scientific revolution in England, and Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle and other people whose pictures are all around here were very active um, and corresponding with like-minded people across Europe. And although not that well known for, for most other things, this guy Yaworth is often how his name is pronounced, um, corresponded with Newton about various things. And then he moved over to England and many brewers, many yeah, brewers came over from Holland to, um, to England at the time and, and earlier, in fact, it was the Dutch who brought the hops over in the first place. Um, so there's that, that connection across the channel. Um, so this, actually, this text um, is a little misleading because this book ends up being about, about that big. Um, the title, Cerevisarii Comes, it's actually Latin. Um, that second word I had to look up at one point and it means companion or handbook is, is one way to trans translate that. So this is the Brewer's Handbook and then of course there's an English subtitle. Um, and just to give you a little taste, we don't have to read this whole thing obviously, but a little taste of how a knowledgeable person in the late um, 17th century is going to describe beer and brewing. See if you could buy this, if, you, if you'd be able to buy this book and then actually set out and brew yourself. So the first thing you want to do is get your water prepared. You're going to boil it very suddenly. When it boils with greatest violence, then put your fire out. All makes sense. Then cool it until the height of the steam or vapor is so gone as you can see your face in it. Right? No thermometers, of course, right? So to tell the temperature, you might stick your elbow in, or very often in these early brewing manuals, they will say, you know, let it cool down until the steam dissipates enough so that you can see the surface, right? At a certain height or something like this. Um, you add in your, your malt, you let it um, soak for a bit. That's the mashing progress, process. It mashes a second time. Um, you let that stand for a certain amount of time, etc. Do they do a third one here? No, I think it's just the two mashes. Then they put it in the copper. Then they're going to add, where does it go? Then you let it out, cool it down. When it's cool enough, you add the barm. That's the yeast. Um, and then ton it up, which means to put it in a cask or a keg, according to the experience of the brewer. So you have just purchased this book pur purportedly, purporting to tell you how to be a brewer and it basically says, well, if you're a brewer, you'll know how to do all this kind of stuff. So a lot of the books at this time frame, time period, are, are a lot like that. Maybe it's not too dissimilar from some of the self-help books you might get these days, you know. You know, if you're just more confident and get out there, then you'll be more confident and, I don't know, something like that. Anyway, they're, they're fun to read. They're, they're fun to read and go through and um, so I wanted to just share that, some of that with you. Um, Here's another book that appeared um, a little bit later. That William Ellis is a brewer, is, a, is an English brewer. Uh, the, the recipe I, I put on the back of the, the handout um, is actually a different recipe. It comes from a, a different book. So this book obviously is for brewers, um, making a distinction between those brewers who are in London and those who are out in the country. But the one I have here, which actually was a little more readable and helpful, I thought, was one he published in a textbook for housewives. So the Country Housewives Family Companion would have been a book that many people would have had, many housewives would have had on the shelf that would instruct them how to make certain things, you know, how to dye clothes, how to make soap, um, how to brew beer, recipes and, and that kind of stuff. And I won't go through the whole thing, but I think the, uh, the first line in that second paragraph is, is, is you know, definitely something you want to you wanna pay attention to. Make sure that your malt has not been eaten by weevils, right? That's the first thing. So these are the kind of things. But actually, it's not, it's not a bad description of how to brew a batch of beer. I, I don't know if you'd be able to do it just from scratch without having any knowledge. But of course, very often, or you know, in most cases, people did not learn things on their own from a, from a textbook. They learned things by doing. So if you were growing up in a household, you would be you know, son or daughter learning this at, you know, from your mother or your father. Um, if you were um, a, young, a young boy at this time going out to find a job and you were lucky enough to become an apprentice to a brewer. You would of course be working for a certain number of years. 
um, for free in exchange for this knowledge. And after those you know, six or seven or 10 years, you would then learn how to become a brewer. So these textbooks, it's interesting to read these early textbooks and sort of see they're, they're not telling you as much, or they're not telling you more essentially than they, than they are telling you. So I included that in there. And then I, I extracted from here at the very bottom um, essentially what the recipe was. And it's not very um, uh, uh, detailed, but I think it might, it might get you a good beer. And I translated it into, I, I, um, I recalculated it for a home brewing batch. Anybody do home brewing? Yeah. Um, if you take a look there, it's not very complicated. Brown malt, a bushel. Anyone know how much a bushel is? I had to look this up. About yay big. Bushel basket. So it turns out, I found one reference to a bushel of malt being the equivalent of about 30 pounds, I want to say. I can't remember. So for those of you who do home brewing, 30 pounds of malt in a batch of five gallons of beer is an awful lot. Usually you have 10, 10 pounds or so let's say, you know, it, it can vary. So I was thinking, well, why might that be? Why would this, you know, call for such a large amount of malt? Well, one reason could be simply that you want to make a stronger beer, which is, which is legitimate. But another reason, it gets back to what I was saying earlier about the quality, the consistency of the ingredients. You're never quite sure, especially when you start roasting, um, when you start roasting this pale ale malt, which has a lot of sugars in it, what the roasting process is actually burning is burning the sugars and turning them into carbon. Um, so you're losing a lot of the, the potential sugars so that that might make sense as to why you put that much in.